Hey guys, welcome back to another video lesson from Rose Medical Lectures. In this lesson, we are going to be talking about Clostridium difficile. And my name is Tania Rose Deco. Before we begin, if this is your first time in our channel and watching our video, please subscribe to our channel below and make sure that you hit the bell notification so that you will be notified as soon as our new video lessons become available to you guys. I really truly value subscriptions, likes, comments that you guys leave because they really go a long way to help support the channel and so for that I do want to really thank you guys. The slides based on this lecture and many medical flashcards are available in my Instagram page. The link of my Insta page is given in the description box. Let's move on to the topic. Clostridium difficile. The Clostridium difficile is a gram positive bacilli because it takes the purple color on gram staining and it's rod shaped. It's obligate anaerobe that is it doesn't require oxygen for its growth. It's a spore forming bacteria and this bacteria has given this name Clostridium difficile due to the unusual difficulties involved in the isolation of Clostridium difficile. This bacteria is responsible for watery diarrhea and pseudomembranous colitis which occur almost exclusively with prolonged antimicrobial use. So, the manifestations arise in association with prolonged antibiotics use. Next, let's move on to the toxins of this bacteria. The pathogenesis is toxin mediated and it produces mainly two powerful toxins. Toxin A or enterotoxin and toxin B or cytotoxin. Both toxins, toxin A and toxin B, are secreted in intestine. This toxin present in the intestine glycosylate the GTP proteins. As a result of this, the cytoskeleton get disrupted. Because GTP binding protein regulate the cellular actin cytoskeleton. So, here when the toxin glycosylate the GTP binding proteins, the cytoskeleton get disrupted and as a result of this disruption, the cell loses its shape, atherence and there will be disruption of epithelial cell barriers leading to diarrhea and pseudomembrane formation. Usually, infants don't develop symptomatic infection. Do you know why? It's because infants lack mucosal toxin receptor. This receptor usually develop later in life. Next, let's see which are the risk factors of this bacterial disease. First one, prolonged hospital stay. Because there is a chance of this bacterial spores in hospital, so it get colonized in colon of the patient. Second risk factor is prolonged antimicrobial use. We know human gut, human gut is a home to different species of microorganisms which live, which live together in a complex ecosystem. These tiny organisms are essential to our health. But the use of antibiotics can disrupt the balance of our gut by killing the helpful bacteria and creating an environment for harmful bacteria like Clostridium difficile to thrive and produce their toxins, which result in the symptoms ranging from mild diarrhea to severe colitis. Cephalosporins, for example the ceftriaxone, are frequently responsible for this condition. Other antibiotics such as clintamycin, ampicillin and fluoroquinolones are also implicated in the hospital outbreaks. Even the drugs that we are using for this bacterial infection such as vancomycin and metronidazole are also found to carry the risk of infection. Other risk factors include the old age underlying illness, intestinal surgery, use of electronic rectal thermometer. Host immune response may determine the outcome of infection. See, for the person developing strong IgG response to a toxin become asymptomatic carriers. That means because of this IgG, even if the person has infected but not display any signs or symptoms. For the persons with inadequate IgG response to toxin A develop disease. Next, let's move on to the clinical manifestation. Mainly, this bacteria causes two manifestations, the diarrhea and pseudomembranous colitis. Diarrhea is the most common manifestation caused by the Clostridium difficile. Other manifestations include fever, abdominal pain and leukocytosis. 
Leukocytosis means increase in the number of WBC in the blood. Usually, it will be watery diarrhea. Blood in the stool is uncommon. Second manifestation is pseudomembranous colitis or Clostridium difficile colitis or antibiotic associated colitis. Pseudomembrane colitis is an inflammation of the colon due to the prolonged use of antibiotics. From the name pseudomembranous colitis, it's clear that there is pseudomembrane formation over the colonic mucosa. This pseudomembrane is basically composed of necrotic leukocytes, fibrin, mucus and cellular debris. This pseudomembrane attaches attached to the underlying mucosa. This pseudomembrane appears as whitish yellow plaque or size ranging from 1 to 2 mm size which is large enough to spread over the entire colonic mucosa. In 15 to 30 percentage of cases, there is a chance to fall back into the illness after apparent recovery. Next, let's do Next, let's discuss about laboratory diagnosis. The lab diagnosis involves the isolation of bacilli followed by toxigenicity testing. The clinical manifestations involve the diarrhea, right? So, we are performing the stool culture for lab diagnosing. Stool culture is done under anaerobic condition at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 to 48 hours by using Clostridium difficile specific selective media. Here you should remember the selective media using here that is CCFA and CCYA. CCFA is cefoxetin cycloserine fructose agar and CCYA is cefoxetin cycloserine egg agar. Stool culture is highly specific and sensitive. But the sad situation is this bacteria can colonize GIT. So only isolation is not enough. Toxin demonstration also we should do. So next let's discuss about toxin demonstration. The toxin demonstration can be detected by various methods. First one is cell culture cytotoxin test on stool. It's highly specific but not as sensitive as stool culture so it's time and it is time consuming second one is enzyme immunoassay for toxin a or toxin a and b in the stool it's rapid but not sensitive third one is enzyme immunoassay which detect the common glutamate dehydrogenase antigen in the stool this glutamate dehydrogenase antigen is found in the toxigenic strains of clostridium difficile even if this method is more sensitive, it is less specific. Fourth one, fourth one is PCR which detects the toxin B in the stool. It is highly specific as well as sensitive. To check for the pseudomembrane, we are using colonoscopy. It is highly specific but sensitivity is low when compared with other tests. Histopathology of colonic pseudomembrane can be done by hematoxylin and eosin steam. Microscopically, these are visualized as volcano or mushroom lesions composed of pus, mucin and fibrin that appear to erupt out of colonic gland. The mucosa underlying these areas often show ischemic like damage like crypt withering, mucosal necrosis and even inflammation. See, in this diagram you can see it appear like fire forming out of volcanoes see you can see over here it is the histopathology next let's move on to the treatment for the initial episode or mild to moderate case 500 mg oral metronidazole is the drug of choice which is given thrice a day for 10 to 14 days in case of recurrent episodes or severe cases, vancomycin is the drug of choice. 500 mg 4 times a day for 10 to 14 days. And for, for severe complicated or fulminant infection, the combination of vancomycin, which is given via nasogastric tube or via retention enema, plus high V metronidazole has been recommended. Next, let's see how we can prevent this infection. The transmission of Clostridium difficile can be prevented by improving hospital hygiene, avoiding contaminated electronic thermometer, and use of hypochlorite or bleach solution for decontamination of patient's room. How can we reduce the risk of infection if the organism is already transmitted? 
This can be done by restricting the use of certain antibiotics such as clintamycin, cephalosporin for prolonged duration. Here, what I just want to tell you is, whenever there is a use of antibiotics and he develop a diarrhea, trying to think of Clostridium difficile as a causative organism. It's about today's video. If you have any doubt, comment in the comment box. Subscribe my channel. Follow me on Instagram for this video lecture slides and for many other medical flashcards. And link of my Insta page is given in the description box. Thank you for watching. Take care.